fall break for Cassie folks and so this is the Friday before the Saturday that I'm posting this and as you can see I'm at home I'm not at school and I'm taking a little bit of a break and uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing with you today so the colic today uh, for the week has been um, I think one of the harder ones uh, in terms of you know the way colics go but also harder in the sense that it uh, it gives us kind of some layers that we where we can we can put ourselves you know we can identify or be challenged by and so this it's proper twenty two it's found on, found on page two hundred thirty four of the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you, Almighty and everlasting God. You are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give. More than, either, more than we either desire or deserve. And to pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except for the merit and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. This is a reading from the book of Second Kings, chapter 2. Now the Lord was going to take Elijah up to heaven in a windstorm. And Elijah and Elisha were leaving Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, because the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. And so they went down to Bethel. Now the group of prophets from Bethel came up out of Elisha, out to Elisha. And these prophets said to Elisha, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And Elisha said, Yes, I know. Don't talk about it. Elijah said, Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. And so they went to Jericho. Well, the group of prophets from Jericho approached Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And he said, yes, I know. Don't talk about it. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So both of them went on together. And 50 members from the group of prophets also went along, but they stood at a distance. Both Elijah and Elisha stood beside the Jordan River. Elijah then took his coat, rolled it up, and he hit the water. And then the water was divided into two. Both of them crossed over onto dry ground. But when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, What do you want me to do for you before I am, a take, before I am taking, taken away from you? And Elisha said, Let me have a double portion of your spirit. Elijah said, you have made a difficult request. If you can see me when I'm taken from you, then it will be yours. If you don't see me, it won't happen. And they were walking along talking when suddenly a fiery chariot and fiery horses appeared and separated the two of them. And then Elijah went to heaven in a windstorm. Elisha was watching and he cried out, oh, my father, my father. Israel's chariots and its riders. When he could no longer see him, Elisha took hold of his clothes and he ripped them into two. And then Elisha picked up the coat that had fallen from Elijah and went back and he stood beside the banks of the Jordan River. And he took the coat that had fallen from Elijah and he hit the water. 
And he said, Where is the Lord, Elijah's God? And when he hit the water, it divided in two, and Elisha crossed over. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I read this passage for you today because it's one of my favorites. And I want to point out um, a variety of things from it that I, I hope will connect with you. So Elijah, he is the first notable named prophet who rises out of the history of Israel after the 120-year reign of the monarchy. You have King Saul and then King David and King Solomon. Each, the scriptures report to us, reign for 40 years. And 40, within the scriptures, is a number that holds a significant amount of symbolism. Right? It's a period of, of testing and going through something to prepare for something greater. And each of these three kings, Saul and David and Solomon, uh, the narrative says reign for 40 years. It's an interesting thing. You know, the skeptic may raise the question, did they each really reign for 40 years? And I suppose if you're seeing God as one who is working in history and doing something that's artistic and creative, that maybe God could indeed have three reigns of 40 years each. But then there's also this literary component to the scriptures, that they are, they're telling a, a, a religious uh, history and it's going to be it's going to be embedded with all kinds of, of symbolism, and this could be one of those those things they're doing to to shape the story in a way that has an artistry about it. Well, it was after the reign of Solomon that the country divides and splits. In fact, one of the things you can see from a thirty thousand foot view of looking at the reigns of Saul and David and Solomon is that one of the things they were working for was trying to create a sense of unity between the 12 tribes, but also a sense of unity between Israel in the north and Judah in the south. You know, just like any country has regions, theirs did too. And King David was known for one who was trying to bring together these, these factions and these different groups. And, and he was successful at that. And so Solomon, his reign, uh, even though he's considered one of the wisest kings in the Bible, He's like all three of these kings. They sort of have a common pattern where they, they for a time are doing what's good and they're, 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 they're living as righteous leaders, but then they begin to sort of spin out. And this happened with Solomon for sure. Solomon started building a, a wisdom culture, but then after a time it was the money and the power that corrupted him. And the country divides and it splits. Elijah is this prophet, the first one notable who rises out of that and begins to preach to the people that they need to come back to God, they need to come back to their center. And so Elijah, there's all kinds of you know, beautiful stories associated with him. But when his ministry ends, God says to him, I want you to choose someone to replace you. And he replaces himself with a man named Elisha. And that's the story I read to you today. Elijah is going to be taken by God. And Elisha is the one who will replace him. There's a story in, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 19 when God tells Elijah to replace him. I want you to replace yourself with, with someone. So he goes to Elisha and he takes his mantle, his robe, his cape, and he puts it on Elisha's shoulders. And this is where the, the phrase passing the mantle comes from. And so you see in the story of Elijah taking that mantle and he rolls it up and he's touching the, the, the River Jordan and the River Jordan splits so they can cross over. And then after Elijah's taken away, Elisha takes that same mantle that was, had been given to him and he does the same thing. He rolls it up and he touches the water and it parts. A close reader would say, well, this reminds me of Moses crossing the Red Sea, and that's exactly what is going on. It's, it's an act that is uh, embedded with what sometimes people now call an Easter egg. You know, it's, a, it's embedded with some, it's an action that 
that rep replicate rep replicate something previously that was important to you as a as a reader of your story. The Moses crossing the Red Sea. In the book of, of, of Joshua, there's a story where they, they need to cross the River Jordan, and so Joshua tells them to take the Ark of the Covenant and to walk it out into the midst of the water, and the, mar the water divides. In, in biblical study, this is called typology. Typology is when an idea or an image uh, from a previous story finds its way into another story going forward. And a typology has two parts. It has the original story, which is called the type, and it has the stories that, that, that mimic it called the antitypes. And what you see with Elijah and Elisha is, an ant, is a typology of the, of the Moses story. Elijah is one of the interesting characters in the scriptures. He, he does not die. You know, as you heard in the story, he's taken away by God. There's only a few places in the scriptures and the Old Testament where this, is, this occurs, and that's the story of, of Elijah, who's taken away in a fiery chariot. And then there's a, a character in the book of Genesis called Enoch. Uh, and it, it's, it's, he's mentioned that he, he did not die, but, be, but was taken away by God because he was, he was faithful. One of the things that's interesting about the Hebrew scriptures and Hebrew Jewish history is that the idea of the afterlife is not something that's solidly set in their cosmology. In fact, even if you, if you do a search on it today on what do Jews think about the afterlife, about whether or not there's a, a heaven or a hell, it's, an, it's really not a resolved issue. And so in the Old Testament, when a person dies, the, pro, the, the prominent belief was that somebody just was put into the ground and they slept there. They went to sleep, they, they died. There's this idea that they're going to be in the heavens with God. And yet Elijah and Enoch from the book of Genesis are exceptions to this. And it's why when you read the New Testament and people see John the Baptist or when they see Jesus, that there's a part of them that very easily asks the question, is this Elijah? Because there's this belief that Elijah didn't die but, and so he could easily reappear. In fact, you may know that in the Jewish Passover meal, uh, when people invite friends and family over to celebrate that, that holy religious uh, day, they set an extra place for Elijah just in case he comes and knocks on the door asking for food because he's alive. The, one of the locations that they mention in the story is the location of Gilgal. In biblical studies, it's unclear exactly where Gilgal is and if it was a place the root word of Gilgal is, in Hebrew, is centered around this idea of the circle. And they think maybe Gilgal was actually not a city, but was maybe like a stone circle like you see in Ireland. And so it was a holy site in that, in that region. And part of, there's another word called Gilgum, which is this Jewish idea not of reincarnation exactly, but the idea that there are certain persons, certain spirits that God has created that God may bring back, put, sort of put back into the game. And so I think what's going on in that story is a little bit of a play on the idea of Elijah, who is one of these persons who God is not going to put to sleep in the ground, but is actually going to put back into play at some point. Right? So the the location of Gilgal and the idea of Gilgum, it's all there sort of woven into the story. But the last thing I wanted to point out to you is the one I really wanted to focus on. It's kind of the devotional moment. Before Elijah is taken away, the fiery chariot, he says to his student, his replacement, is there anything I can do for you before I go? And Elisha says to him, give me a double portion of your spirit. I don't know if there's anybody in your life that, whether it's been a teacher or a coach or maybe an employer or a coworker, or maybe someone in your family, when you see them, what you think of is, I, I wish I could be more like them. Um, I, I know for me, when I was a young man and I was first entering into church work, 
I did some internships with uh, uh, a, a youth pastor uh, named John. And John had one of these personalities. When he went, walked into a room, he just lit up the room. And I remember sort of being not jealous, but being eager, wanting to exhibit some of the gifts that he had. And even now, if I watch myself on a video or something or, or listen to myself uh, give a sermon or something like this, it's me, but I see kind of remnants of John. And I, I, I longed to emulate part of what he was. This is what Elisha is saying to Elijah. I want to give me a double portion of your spirit. And of course, there's something behind that. In the ancient Jewish culture, when a father would die, he would leave an inheritance for his children and he would give a double portion to the oldest and then half of that to all the other children. And part of the reason was because in that culture, it was the oldest, even though they were given the most, it was their responsibility to make sure that everybody was taken care of. And so when Elisha says to Elijah, give me a double portion of your spirit, he's saying to him, I see you as a spiritual father. And before you go, give me that double portion. And so that's when the, the, the fiery chair comes and takes Elijah away. So uh, our, our reflective moment on this Saturday, you know, I wanted to share all of kind of those interesting kind of biblical literary things going on with the prophet Elijah and the prophet Elisha. But the thing I want you to think about today is who is the person in your past or maybe even now who you would want a double portion of their spirit? And then maybe even another question is, who is the person in your life that were you to go, you would want to leave a double portion of your spirit with so that they could use it in the way that God would want them to? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.